350 days a year as a wrestler on the road is, is something that never escapes you. All the sacrifices that you had to do, not only to yourself, but the family. You, you knew that your family was going through sacrifices. I started having kids and you know missing my wife's birthdays and our anniversaries and my kids' birthdays and you know it got pretty lonely on the road. I miss my family. I miss being away from them because I was always either in an airplane or in a car. Seven days a week, twice on Sunday, and uh, it was tough. It really was, you know. The whole thing was about money. And then it got to the point to where <clears throat> there ain't nothing like your family. Money don't mean nothing without your family. Maybe it's a sickness, I don't know, but it's, <laughs> it's a good sickness because I was successful at it. The road part, riding in the cars and stuff, I mean, that, that was torture. A lot of physical pain, a lot of loneliness. Um, I think that um, the good and the bad almost uh, balance out. Like, they're, it can be really great being a wrestler, and it can really suck at the same time. 350 days as a professional wrestler, to me, reminds me of having to get up at 5.30 and 6 every morning to catch a flight and to go to some town and rent a car and then go to the hotel and then go to the gym, have something to eat, and then go to the matches. That was my life. Um, it was a lonely life. You know what I think about the fans knowing what happened down the road and their insight and their, it makes it exciting for them and what was going on. I have nothing to say to them because they would like be telling a little kid that there's no Santa Claus. Let them dream, let them, they don't wanna know, let them think about the, the highlights and the great stuff. They don't wanna know what a drag it is on you. So just, it was great. Try it sometime, sucker. The guys today that I walk up to go to these wrestling matches, they say, well, I'm a wrestler, I've wrestled. And I said, well, have you been on the road? How many times do you wrestle? They say we wrestle about once or twice a month. I said, well, you're not a wrestler until you wrestle seven days a week and every day of the year on the road constantly and living a hard life, living in motels and being away from your family and having hard times, then you can call yourself a wrestler. That means you're being abused by a promoter. That means you're being taken advantage of. That means your um, lifestyle is totally uh, change between uh, being a normal human being and being a uh, robot for the wrestling company that you're performing for. That means you're disrespected and uh, you have no home life whatsoever. That's the most important thing that uh, you, you must consider uh, when you talk about 350 days on the road. You know, Whatever number it takes, 500 or whatever days, you know, I look forward to it, bro. You know why? Because I love it so much. It's in my heart. And um, it's a great feeling. When I hear that term, 350 days, it reminds me talking to Bret Hart in his home. And he was banged up from a lot of wrestling. He says, you know, he says, the problem with our business is we're treated like farm animals. And farm animals work 365 days a year. We work 350. I couldn't have children. I couldn't put them on a turnbuckle while mommy worked. I couldn't have any pets. And uh, I really didn't even have a personal life. So my time in the ring was the highlight of my day. And I do miss that. I miss the thrill of wrestling. They say once it goes in your blood, it's hard to get out, and it's true. People think, oh, you're having a blast, you're away from home, this and that, whatever. Yeah, but you're not with the people you love. I mean, really, if you think about it, I'm with a bunch of jerks that pass gas all the time, that want to eat cheap hamburgers, and I didn't do none of them. Oh, you know, it's good with the bad. Uh, there, because you were a celebrity, to a degree, the, the 
the tempting things, and by tempting things, I'm talking about you go to a town, you, you go to a club after, and drugs would be available, and it's like somebody wants to be your friend, and and so it's it's there. Some guys uh, could deal with it, and some guys have destroyed their lives. Well, I want to tell you, you know, to make some big money in wrestling, you had to wrestle every night of the week, $30 every day. So you had to wrestle six and seven times every week just to earn your money. What the fuck did you do? 350 days on the road with wrestlers, a living hell. I never liked wrestling. I didn't like traveling. I didn't like the disruption of a normal program. Like the years I spent training with Arnold and bodybuilding, you're on a program. Every day you wake up at the same hour, you eat your meal at the same hour, you sleep in the same bed every night, you take the same steroids every day, <laughs> you train at the same time every day. Everything is, everything is on a schedule. Pro wrestling, there is no, there's the schedule is chaos and chaotic. You know, I think a lot of the fans think that you live in the dressing room. And at eight o'clock, the bell rings and the lights go on, music plays, and you come out. And you do your thing, and you go back in. And they all have their popcorn, and they drop all the stuff. They get in their car, and they go home. They're in bed at 10.30. All the guys are still on the road three or four o'clock in the morning. They're going to make the next town. So you're just traveling and traveling and traveling. But when you're young and ambitious and you got that drive like I was, it's part of the business. You know, you don't mind it. Now, I don't know if I could ever do that again. You know, well, I've been traveling all over the place, bro. I mean, you name the name of the places, I've been there. Not once, but many times. Houston, New Orleans, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Mississippi, back and forth. It was incredible. I wouldn't have survived it if I hadn't been in the car with Grizzly Smith. He drove all the way, and I used to swear we was falling asleep at the wheel, but we'd always get there. I wrestled in Tokyo, I wrestled in Korea, I wrestled in Australia, New Zealand, Auckland, Perth. I wrestled in Puerto Rico, Trinidad, Barbados, Second Domingo, St. Thomas, St. Croix. Manitoba and Saskatchewan and Alberta and British Columbia, all the way to Calgary and Montana, <laughs> and long, long trips. There was so much fun hanging around with all those wrestlers. And when I think back on it now, I miss so many of those days. Guys drinking beer and the fun and hijinks in the hotel rooms. And But I think Calgary really had the the, the frontier, Wild West version of, of wrestling, of pro wrestling. I think about driving to Greenwood and Greenville, Mississippi and wrestling in front of 100 people, in front of 100 people, and then getting in a car and driving 300 miles. And and, uh, and it's some of those nights not having enough money to even eat at McDonald's. We would go and buy a loaf of bread and, you know, bologna. We call it bologna blowouts. We'd get in some flea bag hotel and, you know, with two beds and, we take the mattresses off the bed and uh, four guys and flip a coin to see who had to sleep on the hard box spring or who got the mattress. You don't get to bed till five, six, because you've been partying. You wake up at seven. Um, your alarm clock might not work, so you might miss your flight. If, it, if you, your alarm clock does work, you get downstairs. You might be getting on a van to go to the airport, but uh, the stewardesses and the uh, pilots have got it all tied up, so you got to wait for the next one. The guys would check their baggage, which I thought was stupid, and they'd get to the other end, their baggage would be lost, and now they don't have uh, their tights or snakes or whatever. Uh, it was always something. They always did it to us. They always put us on the first thing flying out of there, and they, where did we go from Davenport, Iowa? We'd had to fly to Chicago and connect and go to someplace like Denver, 
LA or something. It was like, it was never close. Or Florida. It was just like. I left Phoenix, Arizona and drove up through the spine of the Rocky Mountains and entered Calgary. And I left Phoenix, uh, it was 80 degrees. I arrived in Calgary, it's 50 below zero. <laughs> and it was the first time I'd ever been in this kind of frigid sub zero weather really seriously uh, uh, death killing uh, weather if you were stuck out in it. Right. And it was an absolute culture shock. Calgary was famous for maybe having one of the hardest um, travel trip like schedules of, of any territory. I think Amarillo was another one that was maybe Louisiana. So I think those are the three that stand out as, you know, hellacious traveling. Um, Usually packed in a van with um, 10 or 12 wrestlers. Sometimes we'd have the midgets that would be working. And I can remember the midgets, they'd stack them up like cordwood on top of the suitcases in the back, and they'd just lie out and sleep on the suitcases all the way to, to Regina. Some of them, I can remember, it still makes me laugh, because I can remember sitting in the van and looking down like this, and there'd be a midget under the seat with his face right like under by my feet. Like, I remember looking down like, oops, sorry, and it's like, it's okay, like, don't worry about it, just don't step on my head. I had a dream, I was probably 16, 17 years old, born and raised in Trenton, New Jersey. And black and white television, giving my age away. And I was a big Brooklyn Dodger fan. It was the era when Mickey Mantle was center fielder for the Yankees and Willie Mays for the Giants and Duke Snyder for the Dodgers. And Duke Snyder was my idol. Uh, they moved him to LA. And my interest in baseball kind of waned as a result of the team that I loved leaving town. And one night, uh, on a Thursday night, wrestling was on live for the Capitol Arena in Washington, D.C. for an hour and a half. And, and it was the era of Argentina Rocca and Carl Von Hess and Dr. Jerry Graham and Eddie Graham and Chief Big Heart with the headdress and Haystacks Calhoun with the big horseshoe around his neck and Bobo Brazil and the Sheik. And to me, these, I was like, it, it, in all of these bigger than life characters. And I decided that night that this is what I want. You know, some people want to be cowboys and some, I, I, I'm sure my parents thought I was crazy. I said, this is what I want to do. I want to be a professional wrestler. I wrestled in, I think 44 of the 50 states. I wrestled in Japan like seven times. It was, uh, going to Japan was an, an incredible experience. My mom and my dad uh, 
were both professional wrestlers. My mom's wrestling name was Helen Hild, and my dad's wrestling name was Iron Mike, Iron Mike DiBiase. And I actually think that's how they met. You know, my mother had been a, uh, she had done uh, a stage show dancing, like choreographic dancing. She danced on stage uh, in like a, uh, chorus lines and stuff with Danny Kaye and Sinatra and stuff. She was a beautiful woman. And I'm not sure just how she got into lady wrestling, but I know that when, when wrestling, when television was brand new, wrestling was one of the first things on television. And lady wrestlers back then kind of, they were treated almost like movie stars. My dad had a heart attack in the ring on July the 2nd, 1969 in Lubbock, Texas. 45 years old. And even though my dad didn't want me to wrestle, again, he wasn't there anymore to keep me from it. And it, it was just that attitude. I was I was so, um, I guess I looked up to my dad so much that I felt like if this was good enough for him, it's good enough for me. But I did make a vow to myself because of my father's death in the ring that I would not outstay my, my time. My dad, um, he never encouraged me to get into wrestling. He never, it was, as I got older, when I was in high school, so I was in the, probably in the 70s, wrestling was not doing so well business-wise for my dad. He didn't have that many fans. Um, business was was so-so in those days. Certain towns were good and some were, some were better than others. But he was a, he was a great promoter. He really loved the business. He's one of those kind of guys that if he could, and he did countless times, break in wrestlers and sort of do all the work to make the wrestler and then let the wrestler go. And then he goes and makes money for everyone else. And like he would create the Billy Graham superstars and the, Abdullah got his first big break in Calgary and uh, Dynamite Kid and certain guys that became huge stars in the business um, through him. You know, a lot of times rarely came back to pay the favor back and say, you know, someday I'm going to come back and help this guy and work, you know. You forget sometimes. My father and uh, my great aunt, you know, they, they were very high people, you know, very high people and... Uh, you know, I got four uncles, you know. I don't know how they had all boys, but, you know, it worked out good for me. You know, and I was just the, you know, youngest kid was around, you know, and it was it was great. I had my uncles, I had my family, but they always called me muddy. I'm, I'm always dirty, you know, muddy with the dirt and everything. That was my nickname to them. Because every time my mom would call out for me, I'm in the jungle somewhere. And they'll say, uh, okay, brother, go look for them. <laughs> they'll come and they'll be yelling and calling and I'll disappear, you know, play games with them, you know, go around the other way and come back home. But they caught me, they know what was going on, so, but I loved it. My parents were not very supportive. My, my mother was always supportive of anything I ever chose to do, but my father had a fit. I can't repeat the language he used when I told him, I, when I just told him I wanted to take a picture, <laughs> I, I actually ran away from home at 17 and left him a letter and uh, that I was going to get into wrestling. And that's, that's how I got into it. I just left, left him a letter because I knew he would have a fit. He probably wouldn't have let me go. And you know, I moved out at 17 and never went back. I got started into pro wrestling because I was looking for, I was 16, um, I broke my neck playing football. My parents wouldn't let me do any other sports. So this was at 13. Um, I moved out of home when I was 14, a neck brace came off. And so I started working construction. But to get in pro wrestling, I was looking for a better construction job. And uh, I saw an ad in the newspaper that said, hey, beat people up for a living and make money. And I go, oh, God, hell, I could beat people up for a living. I'll go make some money in between the side. I went there, and uh, turns out it was pro wrestling, which it wasn't really beating people up. It was uh, sports entertainment. But that's how I got into it. I showed up there, um, trained for three weeks, thought it was real. 
was ready to fight, ready to do whatever. I couldn't figure out what was going on there. And then they said, you do know this is a, a it's entertainment, it's a work, right? And I go, what are you talking about? And I go, well, it explains a lot because I'm like, I'm ready to go, I'm like all tense up. It was a hard life on the road, but it was, you know, it was a lot better than a lot of other jobs. You know, I, I had a construction job, I think, um, before I got into wrestling. A pretty good paying construction job, a couple of them. And uh, I made pretty decent money, but I hated sitting around talking shop with guys at during coffee break about work, like about, um, you know, what kind of, you know, gaskets we needed for the rig or whatever. It was, I hated it. I slowly talked myself into wrestling. Fate has a way of inter intervening sometimes. Uh, my, my dad had booked my two brothers, Smith and Bruce, to uh, Puerto Rico, and he had bought the tickets, and one was S Hart and one was B Hart. And my brother Bruce got cold feet uh, the night before he was supposed to go. And uh, my brother Smith came up, and my brother Bruce kind of came up and tried to talk me into maybe going instead. Like the ticket was B hard and you could go with Smith and Smith didn't want to go alone. And they, I, I got talked into overnight, like changing my life completely. I packed up a little bag and flew to Puerto Rico with Smith. And um, I remember sitting on a beach with a big full moon and looking up at the sky and thinking about it as the waves were crashing on the rocks. And, I can remember just sort of thinking about my life and where I was, and, and I knew what wrestling was. I knew it was a hard life. I knew it was traveling. I knew it was, but I just remember kind of asking myself whether whether I really wanted to be a wrestler. Like this was, do you want to be a wrestler, and do you want to spend the rest of your, you know, do you really want to go for this, or you want to maybe I want to. I was homesick and a lot of other things, but I do remember making sort of a pact with myself that I was gonna give this wrestling a, a real try. And I was gonna not just gonna be a wrestler, I was gonna be one of the best wrestlers in the world. And I always believed in the early days that it was for the benefit of my father that I'd be his salvation or I'd be the guy that would come in and help keep revive things for him and keep his the family business alive. The business was very good to me. Uh, I came along at the right time. I was in the early 60s. I learned everything in the ring. I didn't go to gyms. I, they wanted to get me because I was, I looked the part, I was big, and uh, I was lucky. The wrestling was great. It was, I stayed in shape, I got in shape, I was always in shape, and it was fun. The traveling all around, I got, I got a chance to go to places that I didn't have to pay, people today have to pay to go see them places. I went there for free and got paid for it. I used to be a fisherman guy, you know. Um, I loved to go spear shoot, you know, fishing. And I used to go behind the reef, you know, when the tide goes out and everything. That's when I go down and um, go shooting fish, whatever my mom wants, she'll get it. Like her favorite is that it's lobster. And I always get a lobster every time when she wants one. And I didn't tell her that I was you know, getting into the wrestling business and stuff. And um, when we, uh, you know, came home after she worked because the wrestling comes on in the evening, you know. And we sit down and watch it because she loves it. She loves wrestling. She didn't even know that I was gonna be, you know, involved in it. Brother, when we sat there and turned on the TV, right? And my mom was just looking and looking, and I didn't say any more to her after that. Then all of a sudden, I came in, I think it was number three, which was good, you know, she didn't have to wait around too long to see the bra. And when I came in with me and uh, Cowboy Franklin, we was in a tag match. 
My mother thought she just had another baby. And I loved it. Before my time, you know, like gimmick, look like a gimmick, you call a gimmick. Your gimmick, him a gimmick, I am a gimmick, anybody gimmick. Go from Italy, but Hungary, but Germany, call a gimmick. I think I had, I think it was 18 different, what they call gimmicks. And I actually lived every gimmick that I did. And that made it hard for my family too, because most people, wrestlers, when they went to the arena, they got dressed and went home to their families or they hit the road again like that. I didn't. I hit the bars and that was my character. And I was always in fights and stuff like that. But a lot of the promoters loved me for that because I was attracting attention. My goal when that bell rang and even before it rang was to give somebody something for their money that maybe somebody else didn't give them. In other words, maybe I wasn't good, but I was good and unique. It's not good enough to be good. You gotta be special. Terry Funk told me, Lanny, if you wanna make it in this business, you gotta be peculiar. So since I wasn't born peculiar, I decided to act peculiar. Even walking like the genius, talking like the genius, and running away from people like the genius. When I was leaping Lanny, I was a suffering hero all manly and I'm gonna kill you. I had this mind doll and I would, it had Velcro on the hands and I put it on the ropes and my opponent would take it and kick it and I would sell it, it was kicking me and they'd kick it again and stop it. I would sell it like it was me. And the people were buying it. They loved it because of George's way, poor George. And then I would beat him at the end and they'd raise the mind doll hand. The mystique of the mask was not knowing my identity. I mean, they may have, but nobody ever approached me and said. I mean, I get people come to me today and said, you know, I never knew who you were. And I never knew that Axe Demolition and the Mass Superstar were the same until I read about it. I was a natural. When I first hit the ring, right? Because I used to watch, I used to watch uh, Tarzan. <laughs> right? And you see the Africans, right? Yes, one of them, right? And then I'd get the get there and I'd, they'd show the eyes. They would do this, so I'd go and study, just look in the mirror with some of the eyes, and all of a sudden it seemed like I was hypnotizing myself. When you start staring into a mirror, you know, like this. How long can you do it? Then I started picking up. I'd go into the ring, see the people, and go, find one person who couldn't look at me, and I'd be like this. And when you see him going like this, you stay on him, then they start to move. Vince had come out and publicly said we're sports entertainment. And just by the very nature of the way he presented our business, now it was more of like a family show. And, you know, Hulk Hogan was the superhero who was bigger than life. And I was almost like Snidely Whiplash, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was so over the top, the good and evil. Uh, people understood. Abdullah the Butcher, as you all know, has challenged superstar Billy Graham through his manager, the godfather wrestling, Damian Kane. So I decided to bring out 
an old friend of mine, superstar Billy Graham and superstar. The world's greatest television announcer, Mr. Oh, Paul Heyman. Well. Superstar Billy Graham is on the wrestling scene. And when I get my hands on Abdullah the Butcher, the 24-inch pythons of superstar Billy Graham. I never believed in my own PR. I knew it was a work from day one. I never believed that I was superstar Billy Graham, the man of the hour, the man with the power, too sweet to be sour, all of these rhymes. I never believed that I was really the world champion. I, I always knew that it was a work from day one. I never bought into my own PR. When I was wrestling, there was a guy, an Israeli wrestler named Raphael Halpern. He wrestled as the wrestling rabbi. So he was a Jewish wrestler at that, an acknowledged Jewish wrestler at that time. But generally, you hid your name behind something. Like I was a pretend Prussian, German. My partner pretended to be Italian. We wrestled as the Axis powers. I inside, I, Tomkov, I take you, I break you, I throw you from the ring. So I carried on like that for a couple of years, and uh, it was a blast. My brother, Matt Darby, says, Paul, he says, ever since, they, they started calling me Mad Dog. He says, I've been making nothing but money. He says, we got to find you some kind of animal name. I figured, well, he's going to call me Paul the Bull or Paul the Goat if you want to. You know, an animal name, Paul the Tiger or some damn thing. So he comes up, he says, you know what we're going to call you? We're going to call you Paul the Pig. I said, the hell with you, I'm not wrestling under Paul the Pig. I don't care how much money I'm gonna make. And then we both started laughing. And uh, we decided on, on something else, and that's where I got the name Butcher. When I was uh, back in the Fiji Islands, uh, you know, we used to go to a lot of movies. You know, I love watching the movies, you know, and when Tarzan came out, and I went to go see it, it was all over, brother. Because right then, that sink right into my mind and said, my goodness, I would like to be like that guy. And I said to myself, I said, you know what? I'm going to do it because that's what I want. And my mom, when she would start adding tears and everything, brother, and I knew that uh, she was a wrestling fan. I was wrestling in the Detroit Territory. I'd go to the Northeast in the WWEF Territory, now the WWE, and I would come back and the televisions never crossed. But kids would come in from the Northeast, they would move into Madison Heights, and I'd see them in the corner with a magazine and they'd have a bunch of kids around. It. And they'd confront me, this happened about, oh, maybe twice a year. They'd come up with a magazine and say, that's you, you're George the Animal Steel. I'd take the magazine, sometimes I was on the cover, I'd look at it like this here and say, do you really think I'm that ugly? And their answer was, well, uh... I'd go to a restaurant, and I'd walk up to the people, walk up, you know, make, can I help you? I'd go, me, 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 egg, egg, bacon, right? They said, oh, you want eggs and bacon? Mm. <laughs> You know, I just thought, you know, there, there was a lot of guys that had gimmicks and stuff like that. My gimmick was I had no gimmick. I was just a wrestler. One night, we're coming back from Little Rock, Arkansas. We wrestled there. And I said, George, why don't you get yourself a gimmick and call yourself George something? So he came back, and the next day, he came to see me, 
And he said, Angelo, I think I got a gimmick. I'm going to call myself Gorgeous George. And that's the way I'm going to wrestle. And he became one of the greatest entertainer in the world. The worst thing that you can say to a, to a wrestler is, oh, well, it's just a bunch of phony crap, uh, which tells me they have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. Uh, or, or, or some guy that's, you know, 35 or 38 and 440 years old and he's some great big pus gut who's, you know, you know, hadn't been in a gym in, in five years, come up and say, well, how can I become a wrestler? Well, the first thing I would ask them is, well, what, what makes you think you can? I get pissed when people say anything about fate, because if it was fate, I, I'd have, I wouldn't have, you know, four artificial joints. It was very real. It was very real. It's a tough life. It really is. I mean, when you see someone hit the mat, they're hitting the mat hard. When someone's picking them up and slamming them, they're slamming them down hard. And you have to be in extreme condition to withstand that, just so you don't have major injuries every time. I could show you my doctor bills. <laughs> I could show you uh, in the ring what we do. I don't like to use the word fake. I think anybody that's wrestled takes offense to that. And whenever I would meet somebody and they would say that, uh, very simply, not get mad, not get loud. Um, give them my card and say, this is my training facility. You can come up anytime you want, sign the release form, get in a ring with me, and you determine if it's fake or not. It's not fake. It's show business. Um, the, the, the finishes are predetermined, absolutely. Um, we, you know, uh, I'm not going to try to insult anybody's intelligence. What we do, the finishes aren't real. What the wrestling itself is real. Uh, as far as the bumps that we take and the maneuvers that we perform and all the things that we do in the ring to entertain people, that's all real. It's not real to the extent that we're fighting on the street, but it's real that we put our bodies on the line every single night and it hurts. If I pick you up over my head and throw you on the floor, is it gonna hurt? <laughs> Probably, right? I don't know how you fake gravity. It always seems to win. And I don't see anybody here that's had 20, 30, 40 years in this business that walks as good as most people do. So the contact is the contact, and that's the way it goes. And you can't fake it. You know, I tell you, it's not a desk job. It's a very physical job. Is that wrestling all fake? I go, well, it is orchestrated. But at the same time, it's, man, the getting slammed and thrown through tables and ever getting hit with steel chairs, we really do do that. So the, the injuries are real. What comes to my mind is Captain Lou Albano. He said to me, Lanny, the only two things that's real in this business is the miles and the money. When we did Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, I, I, we, they took a break from the filming and I, and I said, no, I said, you know Robin, talking to Robin Leach, I said, you know Robin, this isn't my house, this is the boss's house. It was Vince's house. And you know what he said? He said, don't, don't worry about it, Ted. He says, we do this all the time. I went, <laughs> So wrestling's not the only thing that's fake on television, right? Sports journalists and people that don't necessarily give wrestling their due, they always were just phony wrestlers. But the ability to do those kind of things, that kind of athleticism, to swing a chair and hit somebody over the head, but to never really touch them or tap them or injure them, this, the, the precision involved with being a pro wrestler is um, unimaginable to most people that don't know how it's done.
My first single match was against Killer Kowalski, one of the great legends of our business. And it's the closest I probably thought I ever came to dying in the ring because he was just on you, on you, and just about the time you thought you could take a breath, he would do something else to you. and athletes, most definitely. Anybody who says a pro wrestler is not an athlete has never taken a single bump in a ring whatsoever. It's one of the most grueling athletic pursuits anybody can ever undertake. And wrestlers are performers. You are putting on a show. There are some incredibly technical wrestlers out there who will never sell a single ticket to a wrestling show because they're not particularly compelling or exciting to watch. So if you're gonna be an effective pro wrestler, you have to be both. They gotta be good on the stick, which is good on the mic. They gotta sell it, they gotta, they gotta build the feud up, they gotta sell, do, have the backstory, they gotta you know, make you wanna come to see that match, and that's acting. I'm a wrestler. I'm a wrestler, that makes me an actor and an athlete. When I, when I first walked on the set at Ed Wood, Bill Murray, you've heard of Bill Murray, uh, somebody says to me, uh, are you nervous? I said, no, I don't think so. And Bill said, why would he be nervous? He's been acting his whole life. The real art of wrestling is an acquired skill. And what you are really good at is improv. And I can still remember the one movie that I was in uh, was Paradise Alley, Sylvester Stallone's uh, first movie after the original Rocky. And it's set in like Hell's Kitchen, New York, and it's club wrestling type of thing. There were a lot of people making wisecracks on the, on the set, extras and what have you, and Stallone stopped the whole thing one day. And he said, I don't want to hear another wisecrack about professional wrestling. He says, we're going to do something here in three days that would take us six weeks to do with a bunch of Hollywood stuntmen. He said, these guys are the best improv actors I've ever seen. I think wrestlers are in a lot of ways are the greatest actors that ever lived. I mean, they were harder working, more realistic. Robert De Niro can go ahead and pack on 300 pounds for a movie, but, um, you know, they'll do all these things for their art, you know, but, um, you know, you won't see Robert De Niro cut his head with a razor blade. You won't see Robert De Niro take a, hair, a chair shot for somebody. You won't see some, you know, like all the stuff that you see in wrestling, um, it's an art form. I consider myself an artist. Anybody else, you get a, a guy off the street and hit him with a chop, he'd run forever and never come back. But we'd stay there because that's how we made our money. So it's like, we wanted the people to believe it for real. And that's that was the mindset that I had. I approached pro wrestling uh, strictly as an entertainment uh, uh, venue. I was never uh, a, a, a technician wrestler like a Bret Hart or uh, uh, other, uh, like a Harley Race, for example, highly precision, highly technical wrestler. I saw no future in that part of the wrestling industry for me. My future in pro wrestling was going to be in the entertainment aspect of it. So in fact, I was ahead of my time oh, yeah. by decades.
really your own director. You're your own stuntman and your own, your own actor. And um, there's a lot more to it than people think. There's life after wrestling. You got to do something after the, the last can upside of your head. So I was in the kitchen telling my wife I want to make this and that. She said, why don't you sit down, big boy, and write a cookbook? And I wrote one, and I've sold 3,000 copies. First, we got the grease in the pan. We put the pan over here. We got this here fine hamburger meat here. We take this hair and we uh, straighten it out. We're browning this up, of course. We're straightening it up right here. Reminds me a lot of my matches. You know, you, you didn't get right over right away. You had to work that crowd. Tell that fat girl in the front row, go home and lose some weight. Oh, God, we used to, we used to love our wrestling fan. And uh, yeah, you want to spread this out real, real good. Oh, you can almost, you can almost taste it right now. And then I'm looking for the salt and pepper. We have the salt and pepper right here in this little glass we sprinkle. Oh, or, uh, uh, I remember a lot of the guys when I used to grab them and punch them. They, a lot of them didn't like You keep browning it all the time, you know. You've got the salt and pepper in there. We're ready for the next. You, uh, it takes about five minutes to really brown this up good. It's like in a match, you can't just 30 seconds in the ring. It takes a little while to brown it up. It's, uh... We have these beautiful peppers. We put them right on there. We've taken the meat out of there. You need to cook up a little faster with that meat out of there. And you take this here and you gotta mix these up a little bit also. You gotta, you gotta keep these moving all the time. Like in the wrestling ring, you, get, you gotta move around in that ring. When you think it's ready, I think it's ready, you're gonna start putting it in the pan. A little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. Oh, that's so good. All right. Now it's, it's time to put the potatoes on there. You want all the potatoes in there? It's like painting a picture. A little browner here. Yes, sir. And there. How does that look? Now, you got your oven right here. Put that inside your oven. You put that on 350, and you can set down because you're going to wait a half hour. Ah. Don't let me stumble. Ah. That's worse than some of the roster matches that I've been into. Sometimes you go in the dressing room, you're soaking wet, you've had a hard match, and you're just waiting for someone to come up and say, that was a great match. And if they didn't, you ask somebody, say, was that a great match? And you better give me the right answer. And it better be yes. Yeah. Don't you know that you're nobody till somebody loves you? You're nobody till somebody cares. You may be king and you may possess the world and its gold. But gold won't bring you any happiness When you're growing old The world still is the same You never change it As sure as the stars shine above You're nobody Till somebody loves you So find yourself somebody to love I think that wrestling is going to be around for a long time. I know it goes through ebbs and flows, but there's something about the 
almost archetypal aspects of villains and heroes. There is a, an urging in the human heart to see evil defeated and to overcome impossible odds. That's something that's going to be with us forever. People like to play out the great dramas. Back before uh, the WWE came out and publicly said, hey, look, we are sports entertainment, so what? Uh, back when we were practicing kayfabe uh, and uh, trying to, uh, to the best of our ability, make the people believe that we're a legitimate competition. We, we knew uh, that most people, uh, be they an athlete or uh, have competed athletically in anything or been in a real fight, and you can watch wrestling you know, for five or ten minutes and go, wait a minute, what's up here? But we tried to present it in such a way that it was as believable as possible. It was a real strict code of uh, protecting the business uh, to the uh, to the fans, and the fans were being protected. They were believers uh, in that era. They believed the doggone thing was real, and uh, they they uh, were very. Some of the fans were very violent. I would, I think it was a time because in '85 was a little bit. You know, they believed it, but they didn't believe it like they did in 79. They wanted to kill me trying to get to my car, and they always knew I was in a Cadillac or something. And and it was, uh, you know, they, yeah, you you were in fear for your life sometimes. They'd burn you with cigarettes and cigars. They'd throw hot coffee at you and try, try to cut you with an opener or a knife. And on more than one occasion, my partner and I had to stand with chairs back to back, swinging at the audience in order to get out alive because they took it seriously. They were, they were very dangerous. The New Jersey crowds were always great in the Boston Garden. They were dangerous at the Boston Garden. It was, you know, it was a little dangerous at all of them, yeah, but it was really dangerous in there. They throw batteries and quarters. They, they would actually throw quarters, 50 cent pieces, you know. I'd pick, I'd pick them up myself. The rest of <laughs> there were places that uh, I remember up in the Canadian Maritimes, uh, uh, being shot at, people had guns, and and it <laughs> that's a little bit of a scary feeling. Uh, shot in the leg, uh, coming out of the building. It was luckily it was a 22. It went below my kneecap. If it would have hit my kneecap, I would have been crippled, you know, for life. The worst encounter I ever had with a fan uh, was a, a barber's razor. Uh, on the way out of the ring. Uh, I think that was a bad encounter. Uh, but you know what? Uh, that, uh, while I, I wasn't really thrilled about that happening, uh, and I didn't realize it happened until I got in the dressing room and somebody said, hey, look at your arm, man. And, and part of my bicep was sticking out. Uh, but you have to understand that uh, that meant, for me, mission accomplished. And we never never stepped out of character. Uh, if, if I was a heel, a bad guy, uh, I didn't want the people to like me and they didn't. While I was wrestling, the fans were in the parking lot, had popped the hood to my car, ripped out all my spark plug wires, smashed my distributor cap, <laughs> pulled off the fuel pump line, punctured all my tires because they were very they, they were believing uh, 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 so much that they were taking their their venom and their frustrations out on me. And I saw my car, uh, I, think, I, I think 66, 67, something like that, caddy, with the hood lifted up, all the tires flat, all the spark plug wires spread across the parking lot, steam coming up, and it looked like someone had bombed my car. And so I, I, just, I was just really an utter... Uh, utter shock that they had gone to that extreme and had believed in this exhibition that we were performing to the extent that they would actually destroy your car and, and destroy you if they could. When I was in Madison Square Garden and a lot of the towns that I used to go to, Boston was one, uh, and uh, many other towns, I had to be escorted by the police because it got to the point that I couldn't, <clears throat> I'd have to fight, and I did. I mean, I've been sucker punched, walking through the crowds and stuff with people. Uh, 
I don't know. And if I look back on it and I'm saying, well, you put up a lot of you know what, but you know something? That's what, that's what drove me to do it. Because the more those people hated me, more of this I made. I want to hear them boo. I wanted to hear people say, you're no good. I love the sound of it. And the wrestling fan, you know, they loved you or, or they hated you. And, and, and I was uh, very lucky. I think me and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat were the only legends that uh, were never, uh, you know, put out there as a heel. We, we never, I, I never got a chance to, to wrestle as a heel. I was always a, a baby face is what we used to call, you know, the fan favorite. and. Uh, you know, wherever you went, I mean, it's just the, the fact that the fans, you know, they just opened up completely to you and, and, and they didn't hold back. You know, if, if the fan loved you, they couldn't do enough for you. You know, they, they want to buy your meal, they want to buy your drink, they want to, you know, they, they just couldn't do enough for you. And, and, and you know, I, I think it was one of the main reasons that, you know, whenever I stepped into the ring, I, I wanted to give back. I wanted to satisfy, you know, uh, their, their reason for coming out and watching me wrestle. I tell you what, I treated fans with respect and they loved me back. Whether I was a heel or a babyface, it didn't matter. Um, I have never been in an actual fight in my life and it's gonna stay that way. Puerto Rico was a territory where, you know, I learned there how to, to you know, build heat as high as you can build it, you know to the point that it's, um, you're, you're, you're playing with fire kind of thing. Like, how angry do you want to make your wrestling fans? How much do you want to butcher up your baby faces until they're, like, they're all bleeding and they're being beaten by eight or 10 guys? And I mean, how far can you push an audience before they lose it? And then you have the Alamo kind of thing. And when I won the belt from Bruno Sammartino in 1977, April the 30th, and after that match was over and my hand was raised in victory with the belt in that hand and the fans realized that it, had, it was really official, the ref had actually counted to three and had given me the belt and I had raised my hand in victory and they were completely, uh, you talk about shock and awe, they were in shock and awe that it was official, I was the new champion. I had to use that belt like a, like a helicopter blade whirling around to beat the fans off of me because I was being punched and kicked and I was having beer thrown on me. I was having, I was having, being hit by chairs. There was a riot going on with me just trying to get out of the ring. And by the time I had gotten back through all of these people, some of the fans at the very back had taken their big quart-sized beer cups and emptied the beer and urinated in the cup and threw the urine on me. So it, it was hell on earth trying to get back to the locker room after winning the uh, the belt from Bruno. I used to have a, a miniature contract in my wallet. It was about four times the size of a business card. And if a guy was in a bar and would start running his mouth and the diner start, well, you know, wherever it was at, what it said was, I, and then it had a blank for his name, request a workout with professional wrestler, pretty boy Larry Sharp, and a place for him to sign and date it. As soon as I put that in front of him, they calmed him right down. And if they signed it, then I'd piss at him. But I remember I was in Oakland and I'd come to the, the, the bar. I was really thirsty when I got to the bar. I got there about 12.30 or one and everyone else was already drinking in the Holiday Inn bar and uh, all the wrestlers were there and fans were there and stuff. And this guy um, was sitting beside me and he's talking to me while I'm trying to, look, trying to get attention to the waitress and stuff. And anyway, I'm listening to him but not really paying attention to him but he's talking about how much he hates my guts and how he wanted to you know, he thought he, you know, he's gonna kick my ass and all this stuff. And I'm listening to him, and finally I just turned to him. I said, "If you hate me so much, what are you doing sitting here talking to me for? You know, 
fuck off and go talk to somebody else. I don't, you don't need to sit here and talk to me. Anyway, I noticed that he's got a beer bottle in his hand now, and he, but he's holding it by the neck, and he's kind of... And I said, what are you going to do with that? He goes, I'm going to do whatever I want with that. And I said, not, not with me here, you're not. And I remember I took him down. All I did is take him down by the shirt and hold him on the ground. And next thing you know, the police came, and uh, the police left. Police came again. They left. The third batch of policemen came. This guy was determined to get me charged with assault. And it was just lucky for me that uh, there was a police chief that was in the bar that had been watching the whole thing. They came up when they were just getting ready to take me away. He came up and threw his badge down on the table and said, he goes, I watched the whole thing. He, he didn't do anything. Let him go. But uh, there's a lot of times you can do some stupid things with fans. You know, I also told the fans, I said, look, I do not get paid outside of the ring. I get paid in... You don't touch me outside the ring. I don't touch you. And if you check the record books, in 40 years, Ox Baker never hit one fan. Nobody really messed with me in the bars because maybe they were afraid of me. They figured I was really that tough. I was just a good actor. Don't you know <laughs> that the world is the same? You ain't never gonna change it. As sure as the stars shine Above you ain't nothing You ain't nobody Till somebody loves you So find yourself somebody I blew my knee out in 1984. In a lot of ways, at the height of my career, when I was finally getting a bit of a break and getting a bit of name recognition outside of the family. And I couldn't get surgery till July. And so I had to wrestle on a bad wheel for four or five months working for my dad, taping it up every night and just hopping along. And there was in no shape to be wrestling anybody. I couldn't run or anything. Uh, it was a very tough time for me, though, three months for those injuries. And, um, and then uh, I got the surgery, and I was out of commission for about five weeks. I had two kids at that time, and um, you know, I had a family to feed, and I had responsibilities. And I just remember um, I was actually booked to go to Japan in a couple more weeks, and uh, I just kind of hit a low point where I realized that I, that I was probably going to miss my Japanese tour, which I desperately needed. It was only a real job I had that was secure. And I just remember dying and my kid came over to my house and he was talking to me. He goes, you're never going to make your trip. You're going to lose your Japan tour. And I go, he goes, I think it was a week away. And I said, I don't know what else to do. And he said, you need to take some steroids. If you want to maintain a physique in professional wrestling, there is no way the physique I had to the degree that I had and that I wanted. There's no way to maintain a physique of that quality and that caliber without the use of a humongous amount of steroids, without the use of speed, without the use of downers to make you go to sleep at night, because you have to, if you're gonna get a workout in, you can't do it at nighttime because you're wrestling. And then you've got to go back to your hotel and you've got to go to sleep and you've got to prepare to hit the road the next day. So you've got to train in the morning. In the morning, you must train. So to get up early and train, you take speed. And of course, you take steroids to enhance your physique. I have tried them. I ain't gonna lie. I did. But I can tell you, that it might have had something to do with me having cancer. But I didn't live on them. No, no, no. I didn't live on them like people might thought I did. I didn't. I took a little bit, tried it. But it wasn't good for my brain. 
You know what I mean? I'm a, I was a little bit, <clears throat> you know, is he crazy or is he normal? Well, some people say he's about half crazy, and they were probably about right. So it's kind of like, all right, and I took, I took a modest amount of steroids that started anyway from that point on. Took them when I went to WWF. I never, never, I never denied that I took them, but I took them. I took them in moderation over a period of time for probably about five years. And when I won the title, I was drug free. My whole career uh, from that point on was uh, was was drug free as far as um, you know WWE went. And uh, <clears throat> I um, I was always proud of being the champion and being a guy that held the championship. Uh, that took WWE after Hulk Hogan and steroids. I can say this much: if you never heard of steroids, you still would have heard of Bret Hart. I saw the physique and the 22 inch arms and the, and, and the body as a drawing card. Part of my package with the tie dye and, and the Muhammad Ali like rap and the whole entertainment package, it fit the package. It fit the package. So I had to take uh, steroids uh, nonstop. And, uh, and that was also uh, the reason I had to have my hip replaced was because of the, the tremendous uh, prolonged use and heavy doses of steroids. One of the side effects was to stop the blood supply to the bone joints and the bone joint would literally die. And my doctor, Dr. Dora, coined the phrase, the death of a bone. And then the blood supply to my back stopped and I had in my back, my spine started to collapse. I lost, lost four inches of height over the years because of no blood supply. And the L3 and 4 vertebrae have fused. There's no cartilage between those vertebrae because of lack of blood supply. And then the ankles went. The ankles collapsed because of lack of blood supply to the ankles. So there was a heavy price to pay for the amount of steroids, the heavy, heavy doses and the prolonged use. I look at my career of 23 years and the fact that I never one single time in my entire career ever injured one wrestler. There was not one wrestler that ever got up the next day and couldn't work and couldn't do his job. I think the only wrestler I can think of off the top of my head that I really injured was uh, Vader. I think I chipped his teeth one time with a chair, but it was his fault. I mean, he was not supposed to move, and he moved. He even told me it was my fault I moved, and it's like, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I took great pride in uh, not hurting any of the guys that I worked with. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the guys I worked with didn't necessarily take the same pride in, in, in their own ability. So I've got extreme arthritis in the joints from wrestling in my shoulders. Both my knees, uh, I need a knee replacement. I tore both quads. I ripped my right tricep. I lost a couple of teeth. I've had 10 knee surgeries in my lifetime. I've had my shoulder rebuilt, my ankle rebuilt. Concussions are, there's no way to count them. I've had a couple of broken noses. I've had both eyes split. I lost my left ear. I've had uh, wrist surgery, elbow surgery, four knee surgeries, a foot surgery, and I need a shoulder surgery. I've had both my knees replaced, both my shoulders replaced. I've had, uh, I need uh, my <laughs> wrist replaced. Anyway, I've had knees operated on Achilles tendons in the back. I lipped off the Luther one night and said, old man, I want your world belt right. He told me to look at something broad in the front row and knocked out six of my front teeth. That was quite an evening. Are we trying to kill each other? No, but you have to have, you have to be in the same type of shape. You're putting your body through a beating. I've had both of my knees totally replaced six months ago. I've had two surgeries on my neck. My nose has been broken about um, seven times. They've taken all the bone out of it, as you can see. And that, that, and those things just happen. Those things just happen in the ring, from uh, forearms, guys landing, whatever. I'm, I'm a train wreck. I'm one of the wrestling's train wrecks. But I, for all intents and purposes, I probably deserve to be from the way I worked. I worked hard. I've had broken my, my collarbone. I broke my uh, sternum, cracked my, fractured my sternum, broke my tailbone, broke my eardrum, which counts it was one of the most painful. Um, 
had my head kicked off my shoulders almost by Bill Goldberg, which ended my career with a concussion injury. Um, broken just about every finger in my, on both hands. Broke my wrist. To this day, that's as far as I can lift my arm. That's it right there. And I'm trying right now to do it. It is just not there. The nerve is pinched so bad. Yeah, I've had a lot of injuries. I've had uh, dislocations. I've had broken bones. But you talk about 350 days a year. If you go in with a dislocated shoulder, a bad knee, a deviated septum from getting hit in the nose between the horns, you gotta wrestle anyway. So most of the wrestlers die at a young age. After they quit, the body does, doesn't hold together. Everybody gets hurt in the game. It, it, you just do, it's part of it. Uh, you're going over a rope, you're going through a rope, you're going under the ropes, you're, you're, you're hitting concrete. You get hurt. So I probably would have been more hurt than I am now. I got a bad leg from uh, football, but uh, wrestling, you know, it just, it just hurts you. You can't wrestle 350 times a year and not get hurt year after year, or worse, get crippled, or worse, get dead. I'm the kind of guy that walks into a bar. You walk into a bar every day. I look around the room. I say, okay, all right, well, there's a few uh, country people. Uh, I'll go to the jukebox, play the jukebox. I'll have 50 friends, not 50, but 15 friends by the end of the night. That was awesome. I love the music you play. Reading a room, right? So you know, with pro wrestling, I'd walk into a locker room. I'm like, ah, all right, all right, well, he does code. And I fit in. I would just go and like, oh, we're going out tonight. All right, so we'd go out. Somebody's doing a few lines. Well, I'll bust a few lines with them. They're drinking. Oh, let's take some ecstasy. I would do all that. But, but my biggest blessing is when I woke up the next morning, I'd be going, what the hell was I thinking? I just spent 50 extra bucks or 100 extra bucks on this and that, where other people were still like, oh, God, I got to have some more. I got to have some more. And so, you know, I think I was blessed with non-addiction, but I was cursed with the fact that I wanted to fit in everywhere and make everybody happy. Piper and me riding down the road, doing eight balls of cocaine. Get up the next morning and go do it all over again. But that was, you know, we were pacing ourselves. That was the 80s. Or me and Ric Flair drinking four cases of beer between towns and still driving and keeping it on the road. During my era, when I first started, drugs were out. Never knew what they were. Steroids, I don't think they've been invented yet. Uh, but beer had. And when, if, if, if one of the wrestlers had a problem, say a problem, it was always alcohol. You know, there's always been wrestlers that drank hard. There's, you know, I think through the 70s and 80s and King Curtis and Mark Lewin in that period, there was a lot of guys that were super potheads and, you know, they got so high all the time they could hardly even lace their boots up and stuff like that. But the, the drugs, the pills, um, they started because I think I always thought it was, uh, it was for sure American. I don't blame the Americans, but I blame the Americans. A lot of the American wrestlers were turning guys on to taking downers and speed. To make the pain go away, to make the pain of separation of my children, because very close to my children, very close. So to make that pain of separation going away, I would, I would, you know, and also make the pain of the physical trauma that I had just gone through in some of these matches uh, go away. 
uh, and my own psychological pain go away, I would take a lot of downers. And I, I, I did have problems with the, with the downers. But the next morning at 8 o'clock or 7.30, I'd hit my speed. I'd drop some speed, uh, amphetamines, and uh, I'd hit the gym. People that travel all the time, uh, they deal with this. They deal with the loneliness of being on the road and being away from home, being away from family, and they, they all deal with it in many ways. And, you know, oftentimes it comes down to drugs and alcohol and other women. And, and, and in the WWF in those days, that's where we were. I mean, we were, we were like a traveling rock show. It was the next town, the next show, the next party, the next girl, da 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 da. You know, your friend Ted DiBiase, hey Ted. Ted, 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 he liked to, you know, the high roll it. You know, he stayed at the Marriott's and, you know, the, the name off another one, the, the uh, Hilton's. And, you know, whereas if I, you know, we're on the road, we're trying to make money and save, you know, at least I was. That was the whole point. We're trying to make money not give it to the hotel, especially when you party like, you know, we did. If I, by we, I mean my partner, tag team partner. I, I probably shouldn't say, in fact, I'm not gonna say Sean's name, you know, because you don't, that way y'all won't know who it is. And, and uh, we used to, a lot of times, it was just a place for our bags to sit for the night. Our, our bags had some of the nicest rooms because <laughs> we'd throw them in there, then we'd go out and party. And I know that you've had Marty Janetti on and it's Party Marty. You know what? There's a mandatory party after the matches. Mandatory means you have to go to it. No exceptions. Except one. I never went to that party after the matches. It's hazardous to your health and your wealth. And that's why I'm healthy and wealthy right now. And that's why very few wrestlers are both healthy and wealthy right now. Now, what did I miss? Maybe I missed a lot. That's okay. I will say this much is that in those days, and not knowing anybody and sitting in a room with a bunch of wrestlers doing cocaine, we really got to know each other. It was a bonding that took place. And, um, you know, contrary to a lot of drugs in co with cocaine or being on it, you, you retain everything. I retained everything. Uh, the lessons I learned, listening to Adrian Adonis in a hotel room talking about what lessons he learned as a pro wrestler and where, how he started and the things that he, had done and the places he'd gone and Roddy Piper and guys that I spent time with. But we, you know, I, I cherish those memories now and I don't see it as a waste of time. Drugs and alcohol are their own master. Some guy can say, well, I can control it. I've seen this guy, I can control it. I've seen that guy, I can control it. Unfortunately, they can't control it. I didn't want to lose my family or lose my life. So it was easier just to say no. And when I first, there was no peer pressure. Maybe it's because of my persona or because of the way I carried myself. Or I'd say no, and nobody would bother me. They'd ask somebody else. And just to fit in, so that guy who didn't have any intentions of getting in drugs or alcohol would do it. I've never, ever experimented with any type of drugs, no, no, even alcohol. And uh, I remember my father, uh, you probably heard of my father, Rufus R. Jones, the freight train. I remember the first day that I was coming up here uh, to New York after I had signed a contract. It, it was so funny. He pulled out a baseball bat and, <laughs> and he called off some names that I won't, you know, mention out of respect. And he said, if you get with this person or that person and you get on those drugs, I'm going to take this bat and beat the hell out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, you know, I had that in the back of my mind all the time. A lot of my friends burned the candle on both ends, and, and uh, you know, we we lived a life like uh, like a rock star, and, and you know, a rock star would get up and and, and play a guitar or sing, you know, and, and a wrestler would, you know, we'd get up and we had to get into the ring, and and uh, you had to be totally aware in the ring because I mean, you're off. Uh, a quarter of an inch, and you know it could be your life. I mean, uh, my my ex partner Rick Martel, you know, God bless his soul, he lost a brother in the ring. Uh, accidents did happen, you know. Uh, we didn't go out there to kill each other, but you know we were out there competing and performing. I remember Wahoo McDaniel. I'm wrestling him one night, and he came after me and he chopped me right across the face and hit me across the face again. And I'm watching this 
stuff run out of his nose. I go, oh no, he's on the drugs again. So I hauled off. This is for the fans. This is a true story. You know, Wahoo McDaniels, big tough guy, Indian, nobody can beat him. I hit him as hard as I could, and I knocked him down. He went. WWE, I think, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but in my opinion, stamping out cocaine was a good thing. That was really necessary. It, it was a, a, a heightened time in, in, in the world where cocaine was epidemic and not just wrestling, but football and high schools and everywhere. It was, it was, in a, it was everywhere and everybody was doing it and there was serious um, problems from that and consequences of people that lost their every penny they had and wrestlers that lost their fortunes so snorted it all up their nose and stuff like that. And then when Vince stepped in with drug testing for cocaine and even with steroids, it was it was good. I was really thought those were good steps to take. And uh, I think most of the wrestlers agreed with that. Then they um, suddenly became, I remember they came in and told the wrestlers that they wouldn't be smoking, no more smoking weed. And um, I remember thinking, that is a big mistake. Everything else is a good idea, but it's not a good idea to make blood to tell these wrestlers to quit smoking weed. Because all these wrestlers that smoke weed, they go to their room, they smoke marijuana, they go to bed. They don't bother anybody. It's, it's like a therapy. It's good for them. It keeps them out of trouble. It, you know, and uh, I remember sort of going like, you, I remember saying to somebody, I said, you watch in a few months from now. You're going to see the cuddling out, you know, drug testing them for marijuana is going to force these wrestlers to start drinking heavy amounts of alcohol and start taking pills because they can take pills. I'm not kidding. Within a year or two of that, you see wrestlers dropping dead left and right, and it's been going on ever since. tell you that are honest it is obvious if you look at wrestling magazines from the 70s almost on every magazine cover there's a picture of a wrestler with blood on his face it was the decade of the blading we used a razor blade to cut across our foreheads and um, uh, produce blood and then your opponent would be bleeding and so the cold mingling of this blood would uh, produce uh, diseases, and I contracted hepatitis C from the cold mingling of blood, and therefore uh, created cirrhosis of the liver and, and caused my liver to go into failure, and I had to have a liver transplant, and the, the liver doctors told me that I am now um, 10 years and like five months post-liver transplant, thanks to Katie Gilroy, who signed her donor card when she was 16 years old. She was that sharp at 16 years old. So I received her liver, and when the doctor, the liver transplant doctor, uh, David Mulligan at uh, Mayo, pulled my old liver out, he said it was the size almost of a basketball, and the doctor told me, he called me Superstar, he's a funny guy. He said, Superstar, you had about 30 days left to live with that old liver. I said, uh, doctors, what, liver doctors, what is the average lifespan of a liver transplant recipient worldwide? They said, five years. I said, well, why am I at 10 years plus? I've already doubled the average lifespan. And they said, because there's something about your genetic makeup also, he received a perfect liver from a 23-year-old young, healthy girl who never uh, drank, never did drugs. And now we've advanced knowledge-wise so far that we believe genetics play a part in the longevity of the lifespan of a liver transplant patient. So I've been blessed with good genes. Maybe that's how I survived all those years of pro wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> to have good a, genes. <laughs> you're a man of faith too. So oh, I'm a man of faith. Oh, I thank God. Yes. Oh, and proudly so. Yeah. 
and proudly so. I thank God uh, uh, that uh, Katie Gilroy, uh, as a young girl, 16 years old, signed her uh, donor card. I received her liver. Uh, two Navajo Indian girls on the Navajo Indian Reservation got her kidneys. And, and, and she said that she also uh, put a personal note in, uh, in her ID that she carried with her. She said, take it all. If I go, take everything I got to keep people alive. So it's a miracle. I think I, I've known Pete for well over 20 years, and I haven't seen him in a long time. I never realized that he lived in Hamilton. <laughs> Pete, you lying to me? No, I've lived Hamilton all my life. Uh, I know it. I started in the business in 76. I had my first match. I've wrestled, I've tagged, got the opportunity to tag with uh, Little Beaver. We've wrestled against, I've wrestled against He's Skylo. dead now, right? I've wrestled against Skylo Low. He's also gone. Oh yeah, you uh, got shot in the ass. Sunny, <laughs> uh, Sunny Boy. A lot of the guys have passed away now, the late great ones. Uh, one of the greatest guys I ever wrestled was a guy named Little John. Oh, yeah, I know. And um, he had a bald head, and the bear man used to bring the bear to the show. Little John, every night, would wrestle the bear. Everybody, he just loved it. He would, the bear man would walk the bear around the ring. John would go behind the bear, run and jump on it, on his back, just stick his <laughs> hands in his fur and hold them. And then Dave would tell the bear to stand up, and the bear would stand up. It was an awesome sight. It was an awesome sight. But didn't that bear used to stand up and drink Coke at the end yep. of the, uh, yeah. Drink Coke at the end of the show. I'll tell you what, it was, it was a show of shows when yeah. he had, he had, I used to call it geeks, freaks, and midgets. Yeah, you know? geeks, freaks, but, midgets, and bears. And we were, uh, we were all freaks. <laughs> The old school uh, terminology for a girl who hung around the wrestling match is trying to get picked up by a wrestler was an arena rat. But we, we actually called these girls ring rats. Ring rats, ring rats. So, it, it, I mean, I can't even imagine having that label be applied to me. You are a ring rat. I don't know why we say that, because it's like uh, rats, rats aren't, you know, that was, what's good about that? I, I got with a rat last night, huh? They were by the dozens. They were always there. In the South, they were always there. In LA, they had them as well. Um, they're just part of what goes along. It's, it's like rock and roll groupies, they're there. So if you're not involved in a relationship and you want someone for the night and you come out of the ring, they're waiting for you. You can have anybody you want at any age. All a wrestler needs, he doesn't even need a payday. All he needs is a six pack and arena rat and he's happy. So there you go. That, that tells you the real depth of depravity that pro wrestling uh, has sunk to in the early years as it rose into the prominence that it is now. I'm sure it broke up marriages. Like I could say I was married married three times, but uh, I, I I told Ole Anderson one time, I my second wife in particular, which was the bulk of my career, I'm not I'm not bragging about it. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I was not a faithful husband from the first day for the whole time on the road. I lived a double I lived a double life. Well, I don't read much, but I remember reading a John Lennon autobiography or someone that wrote it. John Lennon didn't actually write the book, but it was talking about all those crazy times on the road and stuff like that 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 you never really ex what existed. You know, okay, I'll run it by you. Me and Flair would be in a hotel room, and there'd be 35 girls that came up to see us, and we picked the one we wanted. The Beatles, they had a hundred of them. But, you know, we were close there, 35. Three a night was my limit. I mean, sometimes I thought about four, but then, I mean, unprotected sex, there's no telling. You could, there's things that could go wrong. 
starting with children, you know. But I, I just <laughs> I couldn't. I guess the short answer is it was great. <laughs> you got women throwing yourselves at, throwing themselves at you. I mean, just beautiful lawyers, doctors. Strippers, whatever your flavor was, it was there. It was there. The attitude era at wrestling, you were a rock star at that peak, and it was, it was awesome. But I was behaving, but I was getting treated like all the other guys that were, that were misbehaving, and it was so frustrating. I needed it. It was like, I'm not getting the love I need at home, and uh, I'm not getting, I'm not getting the, what I need to sustain or to stay. I got a family to feed, and I, I got my back to the wall, and I got no one to support me, and... A lot of times, um, if you could meet someone, I made a lot of friends and I met people that, that helped me through tough times and I have no regrets and I'm grateful for all of them. I, I'm sure a lot of wrestlers are the same, that uh, you did what you did to survive. And um, I think um, looking back, I, I, I'm grateful for, for all the people that kind of helped me through whatever tough times I needed. Well, there was always temptation. You know, to, to say there wasn't a temptation is lying, and uh, you know I fell off the wagon a couple times, but you know I have a very, very uh, good wife. Very fortunate that uh, you know she stuck with me, and she went through a lot of hell. One of the few guys probably in this business that's married to the their first wife. Um, so I give her a lot of credit. How lucky I am to be the son of Angelo Poffo and Judy Poffo. They were married 61 years. So don't tell me that wrestling destroys marriages. And what about Bill Eady? He's a wrestler, and Tito Santana. And how about Rick Martel? All these people have been married one time, have successful children, and don't tell me wrestling is to blame for all these divorces. You are to blame for your divorce. I'm to blame for my divorce. Wrestling did nothing. I have married 35 years. That's the sum total of three failed marriages. <laughs> I was married four years the first time, right fresh out of college, which really wasn't meant to happen. But my second marriage lasted uh, um, 17 years, which was during the Horseman era, on the road a lot. So you could kind of uh, use your own imagination to be with Ric Flair every night, who used to go on TV and tell the fans, you know, what the, lo the local watering hole was or what hotel where we were going to stay. And Flair always had a limo, and there was a guy who would pick us up every time at the private air center. And after take us down there, and he would say, "No, oh, please, guys, don't st don't stay out all night tonight." No, 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 it's we're not going to make it an early night. Well, there was no such thing as an early night. Although I love my wife and my children uh, more than I love life itself, I was no different. I got caught up in the same things. Now I was never I never had a problem with alcohol and boot and, and and drugs in terms of. I was never addicted to any of those things. Um, I, I guess if you want to call it an addiction, it was it was it was the womanizing. And yeah, I called home the day after WrestleMania eight. My wife confronted me with it, and uh, it's funny how we we rationalize the things in life like that that we do that we know are wrong, and we make excuses for them until they are until they come out in the light. And when they come out in the light. Then you see them for what they really are, and you see yourself for who you really are. I remember promoter Roy Shires in uh, 1972 telling me in San Francisco that pro wrestling is the biggest destroyer of the family unit that he is aware of because, number one, you never saw your children grow up because you were always on the road. You know, the hardest parts for me were the little, the, sometimes the simplest things, Halloween night. You know, people say, ah, it's just Halloween. It's not, a, it's not even a special holiday. Or, but, you know, watching your kids dress up, you know, and that whole ex excitement of Halloween for every little kid, year in, year out. There's a certain age when it's priceless. You miss all that, you never get it back. Christmas, I don't know how I missed Christmases for so many years. I missed uh, birthdays, I missed, um, you know, Valentine's Day, you, you miss your own birthday. You, I just, that's my only regret. I had a great career. I, 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 I'm I so proud of everything I did in it and, uh, and the chances and opportunities I got from it, but uh, I really wish that I could have just been home a little bit more.
for the blessing, my God. I was the first man that he managed. He told me a story about his wife, uh, they have a bitter divorce, so he never saw his kids, my God, for 30, 40 years. And one time when I was wrestling in San Luis, this girl come to me and said, Nikolai, is Fred Bless is going to be with you? I said, no, he don't come to a show, it's just television, you know. He's getting old and bad knees, lots of injuries. And she started crying. And I asked her why she's crying. She told me Fred Bless was her father. I said, give me your phone number. I guarantee you he will call you. I will make him call you. I guarantee you. So she gave me a whole number. I talked to Freddy, and we was all in a room. I said, come on, call this number, Freddy. I have a big surprise for you. So he called the number. Daughter answered. He told me who he was. Pretty soon he was still crying. I said, OK, everybody out. Everybody move out. And he was talking about him for hours. And he was a very happy man. And he said, Nicola, that's the best present everybody could give me. I remember, <laughs> I remember one night. I talked to my wife and I think we, you know, we were reminiscing and then we ended up probably getting in an argument or something and I was on the phone forever and I go down in the morning and check out and, and I looked at my bill and there was an $800 phone call there and I go, what is this? This is BS. There's no way I could, the $800 and then Andre the Giant comes up behind me and he goes, if you don't like it, go home. <laughs> how many how many guys uh, in the wrestling business have a family left when they're done? Most of them lose it because of the lifestyle and so on. Not the wrestling business, because of choices. Do I love the, the wrestling business? It's been very good to me and my family. Absolutely. Why do I really... Right to the meat core. I had two sons, both of them excellent high school wrestlers. Both of them thought about trying to follow in dad's footsteps in wrestling. I said, if you try to wrestle, I will break your legs. Also, uh, what happens with your children is the mothers become very uh, belligerent and uh, uh, antagonized, in my case, the children to turn against their father because the father's never home. And it's almost justified because you're always on the road, you're always out of town, you're, and you're not there to see your children grow because you're wrestling somewhere. You're wrestling on Christmas Day. You're wrestling on Christmas shows, you know? And so it destroys the family unit. And in my case, uh, it, it made my wife at the time, who's the, the mother of my daughter, uh, very bitter. Uh, even though I was sending money home, the money doesn't play, take the place of the father. <laughs> you right. can provide the gifts, you can provide the money, you can provide paying the bills and keeping the electric on and, and everything else and, and all the uh, necessities of life, but you can't provide the human touch of the love of the child and the father. That's gone because you're on the road. You know, I had made up my mind that I was going to tell the truth and I believed wholeheartedly that my marriage was over and I was going to get what I deserved. And uh, much to my surprise, my wife's response was, I serve a God of restoration, not divorce. She goes, I'm not going to make you a promise. I don't know if I'm strong enough to do this. She goes, I want to believe what I've heard you say. I said, but more important than that, I, I want to be obedient to this voice in my heart that for whatever reason is saying to give you another chance. And she goes, I think from what I've heard and what I've seen that you really want to be a man of God. She, and then she challenged me. She says, but I'm just not sure you're man enough. <laughs> and uh, she said, so no promises. She goes, I might leave next week. I might leave six months from now. She goes, all I'm going to promise you is that I'm going to try. That's when the trust and the respect and all those things came back. And today, uh, this next uh, New Year's Eve, we'll celebrate our 32nd wedding anniversary. And we've never been happier, and we've never been closer. My favorite moment in my career has to be when I won 
the Women's World Wrestling Championship the first time, because that was my ultimate dream. I worked so hard for that. I was so focused. I made a difference with women's wrestling, and hopefully I was a good role model for the up-and-coming wrestlers. I was a woman wrestler, and a darn good one. Wrestling's a hard life, and it's got a lot of um, a lot of pitfalls to it, and there's a lot of a lot of bad things that happen to you in the wrestling business, or the wrestling profession. Um, but the truth is that there's a lot of good things that happen to you in wrestling too. And um, you know, the things that I've seen, the places I've gone, the people I got to be with, the fans that I connected with and touched through my career, great moments of um, athleticism. Uh, great entertainment heights, you know. I, when I look at my WrestleMania main event uh, accomplishments, I'm, I'm proud of all of them. I'm, I'm proud of all the guys I worked with. I have no regrets about being in the wrestling profession. I got to see the world, I got to travel the world, got to see pace, places and do things that people pay a lot of money to go and see. I love what I do. I love my professional wrestling. And brother, I'm the happiest guy to you know, get out there and um, let the fans have it. You know, enjoy the Superfly Jimmy Snooker wrestling, and uh, the fans are the greatest in the world. I l lived a dream, and I have a sign over my door that was that was that I put up there that was given to me by Davey O'Hannon. Uh, and when I went to be inducted into the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame, I brought that sign along. And the sign simply says, don't dream your life, live your dreams. And that's what I did. I really enjoyed it. I loved what I did. There's a saying that if you love what you do, you'll never have to work a day in your life. And that's how I felt about wrestling. It really didn't feel like work to me. I enjoyed performing and I enjoyed the fans and just, just the thrill of being in the ring. I take a lot of pride in knowing, and I say this with a great pride, that a lot of the wrestlers that I really love and respect always tell me, a lot of them from Kevin Nash to One Two Three Kid to Roddy Piper to Bulldog, Mr. Perfect, they always tell me that their best match that they ever had was with me. And I think even Stone Cold and Shawn Michaels would say the same thing. And I think I'm, I, I'm really proud of that more than anything. At least it tells me that it was worth it. The fans should know that over the years, I loved each and one and one, every one of my fans. I never hated anyone. And when they went home, they always said, Ox Baker always gives us our money's worth. Whatever you're passionate about, if you're not passionate about it, then leave it alone. But if it's your heart's desire, I, just, I don't care if you want to be a rocket scientist or walk on the moon. You can be whatever you want to if you're willing to pay the price. And the price of success is hard work. I knew where I wanted to go. It was a plan. I had a plan. You got to have a plan. I don't care what you do in life. You better have a plan. I had it. I had a plan. And you know how I did it? I did it with my body. I did it with my looks. And I did it with my brains. When I take the same path as I did, I probably would, yeah, because I love the business. The business was good to me, and uh, maybe I would ask for more money. <laughs> would I do, would I do, oh my God, I am afraid to say I would do it again. I wouldn't change a thing. Would not change a thing. No regrets. I loved everything I did. I actually wish I could do it all over again. I consider myself a lucky man to have been in a business where you got to see the world, Australia, New Zealand, all throughout Europe, every place in the United States and Canada. I got to do it all for free. And I loved every moment of it. You gotta love this business. And the only way to get out of this business is to give it 150%, because if you try to go halfway, you don't get it done. And I can tell you, in 40 years, no matter where I was at, Ox Baker 
always got it done. Wrestling, you know, there's bullies, there's guys that are bullshitters, there's con men, there's great guys, there's great athletes, there's great performers and showmen and characters. And, you know, when you open up that dressing room door, it's, it's such a um, chocolate box of um, characters. I mean, it's, and I think from every country that I ever worked in, all the territories I was in, it was always, always a great adventure.